Good afternoon. At the tone, Pacific Daylight Time will be 5, 4, and 30 seconds. Water. Oh my god, we're having an earthquake. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Can you feel that? Okay, this is interesting. There go the lights. Oh. We are here at the American Red Cross Central Coast Chapter. It is the 8th of October, 2019, and we are all here to talk about the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're gonna start on the left, introduce yourself, and just go around the table. Patsy Hernandez-Gasca. Tiki Villamora. Romina Cervantes. Jim Burns. Michelle Averill. Rick Martinez. Lyle Crosley, Rosalie Crosley, Karen Bonney, Carol Evans, Jill Hoffman, Linnea Dunn. Perfect. Again, thank you all for being here. Can we start again, same order? Um, just tell me how long you've been in Santa Cruz. <laughs> um, most of my life. Um, the last six, 17 years with her. Oh, I've been in Santa Cruz actually since <laughs> 1950. <laughs> I've been in Santa Cruz for over 35 years. I grew up in Monterey. I've lived in Santa Cruz for the past 35 years. Yeah. I've been here my entire life. I've been here my entire life as well, and I'm fourth generation Santa Cruz. Ooh. Been here about 45 years. Forty-one years, and I moved from San Jose forty-five years ago. I've been here forty-one years. I've been here since nineteen sixty-nine, and I can't remember the exact that. Yes, nineteen sixty-nine. I am only here twenty-three years, but I was just over the hill with the earthquake. Perfect. What What were you doing during the earthquake? You didn't start. Oh, I'm gonna pick on you. She was organizing. <laughs> Of organizing her? Yeah. <laughs> Hard to do. Um, I was at home. I had three small children, so I was in the midst of preparing dinner when the shaking started. Things were flying. I was in my kitchen area. Um, I had a lot of internal damage, um, but I could hear it was a hot day, so my kids were outside playing, um, and I could hear them pounding and screaming at the door to come in. Um, so all these years later, I still recall those screams. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was on Electra's Drive, taking a walk. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden it just happened. And it was so quiet. It was really, really quiet. And then this woman came up to me and she grabbed on to me. And she wouldn't let me go. She just, you know, really scared, I guess. And so I said, gosh, what am I going to do here, you know? <laughs> and so I talked to her to, you know, just take the good this way. And so we uh, stayed on the cliffs for a little bit. Then you could see all the smoke coming from downtown, you know, and the fire engines. And it just went from complete silence to all of a sudden the activity started. And uh, that was interesting that way. <laughs> um, I had the fortunate the pleasure of being in a small church in Ben Lomond. Um, I was studying with a math tutor, I was uh, uh, Larry Valerie is my math tutor, and I had just mastered this concept, and I was like, oh yeah, I got it. And then the world started to shake, and then books and binders and church choir books and Bibles were coming at us. I was never afraid of a Bible so much as that, that night, or that afternoon. Um, so we're, we dove under the table, and everything was just shaking out of the, the windows. We went outside, and we heard kids scream. And um, so Laird and I went outside, and what really scared me was the church had a cross, and the cross was so great, so we're like, oh my gosh. Um, and then I had about 10 little kids that were in this um, area where they were all by themselves, and they were crying, and so I went out there, and I said, hey, you guys, you guys are going to be okay, come on over. We moved over to the large parking lot, looked around to make sure nothing would fall on us, and I had these 10 little kids who were scared out of their minds. And I didn't know what to do, um, but I had taken babysitting training through the Red Cross, so that kicked in. So I got them together and I said, let's start singing some songs. 
And then as each earthquake aftershock happened, we would you could feel the ground moving. And I said, let's pretend to be cello. And let's what, what's your favorite cello kind? And I started distracting the kids and then started uh, singing. And then one by one, the parents started showing up. And that was the biggest thing. As soon as the parents got there, that's when I freaked out and started to cry. Because then I felt I was, I was OK for me to be scared. I was finishing up a, um, my work day at UC Santa Cruz, where I was one of the people that was in charge of communications on the campus at the time. Uh, I was in a, actually, a fairly safe building because if, if you know that campus, it has a lot of old historic buildings that are left over from when it was the Cow Ranch. And so I was in the carriage house, which had survived the 1906 earthquake a large wooden timbers and so the building swayed a lot but and you know a lot, a lot of books came off the shelves but i don't think i really fully appreciated the severity of the earthquake until i tried to get home across town uh, to my wife and our two very young children and ended up driving through the downtown before it was closed off um, right by Ford's department store when there were fatalities. And, um, and then I, I spent the next month really kind of helping the campus communicate about to the 10,000 students that were there at the time. It was, it was really an amazing time and, you know, very challenging and uh, it just, you know, such a difficult time for Santa Cruz, but uh, but I was happy to be a part of it, trying to help them. With it. I was in Watsonville. <laughs> I was um, working as a demo assistant, and I was at my job. Um, I had gotten diagnosed with a brain tumor ten minutes before the earthquake started, and so I had no idea what my life was going to be. And um, the earthquake happened, and in those moments, I was thinking, well, I'm going to die anyway, so it doesn't matter. And it was just a really interesting time, and when I didn't die, <laughs> um, I drove home um, and drove past Watsonville Hospital um, to get to Corlitas, where my family lived, and saw all the tents and everything set up as they were triaging folks. And over the months um, and weeks after the earthquake, watching the Red Cross in action, setting up the tent city and all the work that the Red Cross did, trying to get people back on their feet again was just phenomenal. And living in Watsonville and seeing you know, what happened to that community as a result of this um, earthquake was really something you know, just to witness in that. And, um, it changed my life because I went from thinking I was going to be a dental hygienist to um, then wanting to do something in serving people and seeing folks at their most um, at need time in their life and wanting to be able to be there to be a support and just knowing what fear felt like and having an unknown over your head like that, um, it just shaped who I was to become in the future. and so. It just changed my life. I was uh, at my parents' house getting ready to watch the World Series. I was waiting for them to come home. <laughs> when the earthquake hit, I was uh, probably less than a mile away from the epicenter on Trail Colch Road. Uh, a window blew out on the house. A uh, family dog dove out the window. I followed the dog out the window, figuring that was probably the best route out. And uh, basically, was in the driveway with the dog for uh, uh, quite some time until a uh, sheriff's deputy uh, pulled up and asked for me by name. Um, when I confirmed who I was, he says, you need to grab your gear and reporting for work. Uh, so I ended up becoming one of the first responders into the downtown that evening. I was at the time working for uh, the Parks Department, the Lifeguard Service, uh, as well as up at the Parks Department, the Poganet area. So I was uh, initially a uh, rescue responder, uh, helping to uh, go through uh, debris in the downtown and uh, then was quickly pulled away from that role and into a law enforcement role to help contain the chaos in the downtown. So I 
had a, a few different hats in those initial uh, hours uh, following the earthquake and spent uh, pretty much uh, the next few days on uh, the rescue efforts and containing the chaos in the downtown. My well, wife and I live right close to this uh, chapter here, and I was prepared to get up to go out to a catering job that evening and watch the World Series, or started to anyway. And as I started to stand up, the next thing I remember, I was on the floor because it actually knocked me to the floor next to the couch, which is a good thing because the mirror behind me was a huge mirror, came down, crossed me, and landed on the table. So I'm laying there thinking, <laughs> well, what you can't think, it's just happening so fast. But everything in the house went up on the floor. Right? Glass, the stairways coming down, the TV went up on the floor, the water jug we had across went up on the floor, water all over the place. Everything that was in the cabins came on the floor. And it's an older house, so it shook pretty good. But my first thought was, when it was over, when it stopped, my first thought was, thank God I'm okay. My next thought was, where she was, I knew she was up at Cabrillo College, and I just said a little prayer then that she's okay, she'll wind up coming home. And then my next response was, what can I do now for myself and the neighbors around me? I want to make sure I knew gas needed to be shut off if, if there was any leaks. And there's a uh, there's a now what's called CERT teams in this area across the country now that have been developed for emergency groups. If you're in your neighborhood, you sort of citizens emergency response teams. And I realized that now that that's what I was doing because I zipped around to the elderly lady across from the fence from us, and she all her stuff was on the, on the floor, and she was very elderly. Got her out, I did smell gas, got her gas shut off, went across the street, water was shooting up in the air, made sure their gas was shut off and our gas was shut off. By that time, after doing all this, she shows up and from that point on, our concern at that point in time was family. Where is our family? What you know, what can we do to keep make sure our family's safe? I think we camped out camped out in our backyard for five days. We set up tents. We had about 25, 30 people in our backyard in tents. Uh, cooking food out there. Nobody wanted to go back into their homes because of the aftershocks. So there was a lot of emotional things that went on at that, that particular time. Uh, first of all, I was concerned for loved ones, and, and then next, what, what you can do. And I think that led me to the Red Cross because I realized we weren't prepared for that. I was not prepared at all. I had no idea that, <laughs> the, the, how bad it could be at that time of a major earthquake. So, so we've been in, in Red Cross now for almost that same length of time. I was at Cabrillo College in the cafeteria going over my last, the notes last minute for an astronomy test, and I kept thinking I heard a train. And I knew there was no train nearby, but it seemed to be getting closer and closer, and finally I just looked up expecting it to come through the wall. And it was the earthquake, and I heard screaming, and the tables started chattering on the floor, all those tables, and it was so noisy. And so everyone ended up under the tables, and I was trying, I saw a boy that was just standing there, shocked. So I was trying to get out and pull him under the table, and I, I was on all fours, and lifting up one arm or the other, I couldn't stay up, I was just thrown around. And of all the crazy things to think about, I thought, oh my God, what that showing? Because my skirt, you know, I had all the dress. It's a woman thing to think, right? And then it was so severe with this, the noises and the sever severity of the earthquake, I thought I was going to die, and I was very, very calm. And I thought, my thought was very clear. I thought I would be my wild because we're together so much. And um, then came home and joined him. Oh, getting in the car to go home. There was not another car on the highway and nothing on the radio. It was absolutely quiet. So it was very eerie. And so I got home, gathered up our family, and just got busy taking care of them. And then a couple of days later, I came down here. I couldn't just sit through the aftershocks anymore, not do anything. And Carol, I told, I came in and Carol talked to me and I said, what can I do? And she took me around to the cooking trailer. Uh, I've just been with Red Cross ever since, and it has literally changed my life. Really, really. Well, I was cooking dinner for 
my husband, and I was glad I was cooking on a ceramic cooktop because when the earthquake hit, the uh, paper napkins that I stored over the stove all fell down on the cooktop, Ooh. and at least there wasn't a flame. So now I always tell people, they don't know, there's something else you don't know about disasters. And embarrassing, though, because I had been teaching disaster preparedness before. <laughs> <laughs> so that was one of the things. And uh, that, uh, as soon as I could see my husband was okay, and certainly we're up in the mountains, and it really, really shook. And um, I had lots on the floor and everything else. But I said, uh oh, I need to go to the Red Cross. And I grabbed my keys and I said, I don't think I'll be back tonight, which was very true. That's a prophetic. <laughs> Um, so I was the exec for the American Red Cross when the earthquake happened, and I was here in the building. We were in the room next door. We were planning out the auction, the annual auction. So I was with three other people, Shirley Lance, who a lot of you used to know, uh, Andrea Nassenbeam, and another woman. And we were, so when the earthquake happened, the lights started flickering, the emergency light, if it's still on in there, went on. We all got under the table and held on. And um, there was a blood mobile going on in here, which, uh, and there was a woman who was British who just got on the table for the first time to give blood, and they had just put the needle in her arm when the earthquake happened. And this room had cracks and was later yellow tags, so she was really freaked out. She was screaming, the nurses were um, reassuring her. The, we had some volunteers there, I think my board chair then, Bill Miller, was in. Um, with the safe, which fell off the container and fell onto the floor. And books fell off and things happened, but not as much damage as you might expect. What I remember doing is I'm uh, going out, because you know we've been drilled, and turning on the generator and getting the building up and running and making sure the lady was okay here and sort of taking stock of what was going on here. At that point, we lived uh, up in the mountains, uh, and my son was at Happy Valley. He was six years old. He had just started first grade. So my board chair said, well, why don't you go check on Adam, and I'll stay here and make sure everything's okay. So I, like everyone said, it was really quiet. I drove up to Happy Valley School. I talked to the caregiver. He had been outside when it happened. They were just at a table. So he wasn't traumatized at all. He wasn't scared. And Laura offered to keep him overnight. So she did. And I came back to the chapter. And I didn't go home again for three days. And the time I finally went home after all that, you know, we opened shelters that night. We slept on the floor here. Um, but when I finally did go home, it was to find two pairs of shoes and a dress that matched so I could take a shower and meet the President of the United States. Oh, so, <laughs> it's one of those memories that I don't think you ever forget. Because I, a week, by the time I got home, our, our house was in the mountains, five miles from the earthquake. So the refrigerator was in my living room. The doors were, every drawer was open and cracked. There was no power. And I was with a flashlight looking for two shoes that matched and shampoo. And then I went to my board chair's uh, house and took a shower. And then the next day I met the president. So it was pretty extraordinary. And one of the things I remember is the pre-team uh, for the president came the day before. And they said to me, you have to go meet the helicopter in Scotts Valley. And I was like, by this time we had sort of a crew of volunteers here. And so I, I went out to Scotts Valley with, I don't know, one other volunteer and a ham radio operator. And this helicopter landed and these guys got out and they were the PR team for the president. And apparently uh, with Hurricane Hugo, President Bush didn't get really good reviews because he wasn't real responsive, so he really wanted to look responsive here. So they wanted to figure out where he should go. And so we went around and we looked at the shelters and we took him to the Civic and they walked in and they go, no, we can't have all this homelessness. We need another kind of shelter. <laughs> so that was really interesting. I mean, to pick the place where the president would do it, where he would walk the mall, which by then, so they laid all that out. Then they got back on the plane and said, Next morning, be there on the mall at 9 a.m. to meet the president. So it was pretty extraordinary. It brings up an important point, though. You know, when a, when a president visits a disaster zone, mm -hmm. it, it transitions the entire response teams into a totally different mode. Yeah. People may criticize, you know, the national <coughs> leadership for not being responsive. You know, maybe give the Hugo example, but um, that presidential visit was a huge burden 
on those yes. rec- yeah. on those disaster response resources. I right. can say that as you know a first responder. I think Carol probably agrees. Um, although it does help with the national approval rating of that particular leadership, um, it's not always of value to those communities because it, it logistically uh, took a lot of resources to assemble. Uh, it diverted a lot of attention away from uh, needed response, and it was. Uh, it, it, it really changed the whole flow of what our response looked like when, you know, when George Bush showed up. I, I would say though, I, and I agree with you totally, because it ripped me away from the response effort. You know, it put me in a mode of finding high heels. But, <laughs> but I, finally showering. <laughs> but I, but I do remember, you know, talking to him about. I, I think the Santa Cruz community gave eighteen thousand dollars to Hurricane Hugo, and I remember saying that to him. And he turned to the CNN and said, and now is your chance to help this community. And within maybe half an hour, we got a $100,000 donation. So from that point of view, I think it focused some attention. But I, I agree. You know. And then after that, we had um, Billy, Bill Billy Graham, Graham and yeah, all of the other people who came in. Well, we had Dan, Dan Quayle. Dan and Quayle. That was, so those were all very impactful. I remember that first night when we were saying there, what, what do we have to prepare for? And I said, well, well, phone's going to ring off the hook, and people are going to bring supplies and put them here by our door. Right. And I said, and the press will be here. And you said, oh no, 17 is closed. Well, knock, 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 four in the morning. Yeah, all night long. Yeah. So that's you in the, in the photo walking the yes, hall. Right. right beside the press. I've seen that photo. It was interesting because the uh, politicians, they didn't want to invite the politicians right off the bat because they wanted to show that they were more responsive to the relief efforts. And uh, so um, the politicians found out about it later and they, you know, they co coalesced and wanted to be around him. And at one point I kind of got pushed back and he put his arm around me and held my hand. So that, because I think he just wanted to be seen with the Red Cross. And um, the board chair, uh, Lee Duffins, yeah. who you know, was oh, yeah. in that picture too, and then another Red Cross volunteer, uh, Larry Gilliam. And we, Karen and I have a nice memory of that. We told Larry to meet us at Ford's department store so he could walk them all with President Bush. Well, he was so he was so freaked out by the whole thing that when the police wouldn't let him through the line, he said, "I'm supposed to meet." President Ford at Bush's department. Oh, wow. <laughs> I think I'm home. Wow. Let's let him in. <laughs> but he finally got through. He's in the picture. Today, so. um, really, I, um, real quick. Okay. Can I, when you, when Carol, when Carol's talking, can you just lean back? Absolutely. Cool. You don't have to. I mean, it's your turn. Yeah. So you oh. can go. <laughs> so, for, for the teacher. Okay. Um, go, go for it. I um, had volunteered for Red Cross since 1981 when we had horrible floods and we had Camp Joy and we, uh, along with Karen Bonnie and I, had set up a small little uh, mental health response. And so in, uh, we had an MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, with County Mental Health. I was working at 5 o'clock County Mental Health counseling a couple and I uh, remember the the shaking and this huge sound. We were six miles away from the epicenter. And I remember, I didn't know if it was a bomb or what had happened. I thought the end of the world. I didn't know what was going on. And all I could think of, and now we know better, we don't say door frame anymore. But at that time, I was going door frame. And I very calmly said to the couple I was working with, door frame, door frame. And then I went next door to make sure my counterparts were OK. And six weeks later, I met that same wonderful couple again, and they said, oh, Jill, you are so amazing. You are screaming at the top of your lungs, door frame, door frame. It's all perception, right? I thought it was so calm. And, um, and basically, I hit the road running. I went home to make sure everybody at home was OK, and everything was tossed all over the living room. Um, my bookshelf, luckily, had not fallen into the living room so I could walk through. And um, I remember checking in with my family, and all of a sudden, my boss at County Mental Health came riding up in a bicycle because my bridge was broken to my house. And there was no way the cars could get through. And he said, look, we're going to go respond to the civic. 
we have the MOU with the Red Cross, we're going to go respond. And so my very first experience um, of working the earthquake was going down to the Pacific and working with Karen and, and the other folk. And it changed my life. It altered my life because I ended up working International Red Cross and twice as a responding to earthquake, one in Turkey and one in the Armenian earthquake 10 years after they had us come and work with them. And uh, I'll talk about that later, but uh, I ended up running Project COPE, which was the FEMA response. And so I had 40 clinicians working for me, and we saw 25,000 people in 18 months. I should see what Project COPE stood for. Project COPE stood for coping um, with emergencies and disaster. Coping with case. That's right. Um, and it was a FEMA grant that we had for 18 months to provide mental health response um, to earthquake victims. And so we worked in the tent cities, we worked in the mountains, we worked with nine women who had given birth to children on October 17th, and we created self-help groups. So they met for eight months after. Once a month they'd all meet, and that was an amazing sort of resiliency experience. So I wasn't in Santa Cruz, I was in Santa Clara, which is almost as close to Loma Prieta, Santa Cruz. And I was working on the second floor of an office building as a software engineer. And ground started shaking, I'm a California girl, so I, you know, headed straight under my desk and it, the shaking just kept going and going and I got very curious, so I crawled out on my hands and knees to peek out the corner of my cubicle and uh, to watch the ground rolling as we go. And so my only injury in the earthquake is I got skin knees from crawling on the rug. But our a work group at that point had planned a potluck dinner that night at my house. And after the earthquake was going, we all kind of trembled together in a group and said, hey, you know, we've got these pots of food all prepared. Why don't we just go ahead and do it? We don't have anything better to do and we know where our family is. So we drove to my house, which was not damaged, no electricity, but I had plenty of candles and so, and everything was great. Unlike Santa Cruz on the other side of the hill where the freeways were down, the side streets were just packed. It was intense traffic, no traffic lights. Everybody was so well paved, four-way stops. Nobody was pushing, no horns honked. It was just, everybody was taking care of everybody. And it was, it was a wonderful experience just to see people being a community. So that's my story. I would like to now, if you could just talk about your involvement with Red Cross during the earthquake. As a, uh, as a first responder, we didn't really see um, any, any real meals uh, for the first few weeks. So the only thing that really kept us going uh, for the entire couple of weeks in the, the downtown area was a canteen that they had in the middle of the intersection of Cathcart and Pacific Avenue. So that was um, really our lifeline and, and what kept us fueled uh, to continue our you know, rescue efforts and just our, you know, our containment response into the downtown for you know, the entire team that was down there. In essence, uh, you know, the entire community of Santa Cruz became an island. There was really you know, no way in or out with the exception of helicopters. So all the resources that were being brought in at the time were coming in by helicopter and they were being deployed throughout the community. You know, Red Cross was running multiple shelters and so you know, we were partnering with the Red Cross in order to you know, ensure that you know, the shelters you know, were safe, that you know, we were helping log people in. It was, uh, it was really a, a pretty significant collaboration between all the first responders and the, and the Red Cross. And it was um, certainly a mutually beneficial uh, partnership because, you know, like as I mentioned, it kept us fueled up during, during a very difficult time. Because, <laughs> uh, I mean, water, food, everything was pretty scarce fairly quickly. Um, and so, you know, our real lifeline was, was the Red Cross for those first few weeks. And it was weeks. It, it took a while to, 
to, to get everybody back on their feet. And I never left after that, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I always had a special relationship with the Red Cross, and I think that uh, that was probably one of the one of their early early relationships and what drew me to the Red Cross. Well, I wasn't a member of the Red Cross at the time. Uh, when Rosie decided she wanted to come down here to, and help out with the Red Cross, I said, well, you, you go, you, you take care of that if you can. I'll stay at the house, take care of family, get things back in order, because again, you know, you're and it's actually like that where in mean, the house is on the floor and you, you don't even know what's under the house. I finally got under and looked at the piers and they were all still standing. I couldn't believe it. Uh, so the house was good, but by that time uh, she had gone down every day and uh, was Red Cross so I guess you could go. I'll support you in any way possible. But not long after that, the Pajaro floods hit. Uh, there were lots of them. I think Patsy was involved at the time. And she was asked to go out and open the door to the, to the fairgrounds to shelter people. So I said, well, I'll help you. Still not a Red Cross member. She's just brand new. She got we opened the door. Nobody's around, and somebody walked up and said, "Are you prepared for uh, up to 800 people?" Said, what? <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? Nope. Well, we're gonna have to shelter and feed up to 800 people. Probably four in this room, four in that other room over there. But they're setting off. I'm looking at her. What are we gonna do? <laughs> I had no clue. I look around and I see a Red Cross trailer drive up. I see just cots coming out. I see a table set up to check people in. Meanwhile, food is showing up at the back door. I don't know where it came from, but it just came our background is food. So we, we kind of, well, let's do that. So we set up a buffet line type of thing for anticipating. And sure enough, people started checking in. Uh, a lot of people, I think it was close to 800, if I'm not mistaken, it did show up there. They were there for weeks. Yeah. And the next thing you know, Patsy's saying, can you, uh, can you go in at nighttime and be a nighttime supervisor? I don't know, they ran across that. <laughs> that so that was the time I realized I need to take some classes because uh, this is important. And I did. I took some classes after that, and we've been doing this uh, for over, what, 20, 30, 30 years? Mm -hmm. So the that was my time. involvement. So. And I enjoyed it, doing it ever since because it's a very, very important thing to do for, for yourself and those out there that need help. So. It is. It's very rewarding. I was called to Florida sh shortly after that, and I left a note on the table saying, "Gone to Florida." What? But he didn't answer his phone. My, my sons. I always call my sons. I have three sons. I always call them, tell them where I'm going. Well, does Papa know? Does Papa know? I said, well, oh, he didn't answer his phone. So off I went. And he, we usually were together with a team, and he wasn't very pleased about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I said, well, then take some classes. So we did. <laughs> and we've been going strong ever since. But what started the interest in feeding was when I was working from that feeding trailer, I got to go out on the road to Watsonville and go to park. People wind up getting food, and the faces were so beautiful. And that's what I see every time I go out. Well, TV, that's, that's why you cool. cool. always drive the Earth still now. <laughs> After all these years, we kept trying to promote TV. She was such a natural. She go, wouldn't you like to supervise the Earth driver? She goes, no, I just like Earth. <laughs> <laughs> For the same reason that, that she was talking about. <laughs> Um, but one thing about happened there when I was on West Cliff, well, my first thought that I'm a water person do is a tsunami. You know, that's what I was actually thinking. And then before long, you know, first you had all the, you could see the smoke and everything happening, but then the fire engine came by West Cliff and asking everybody to stay off the cliffs, go back, you know, quite a ways actually. You know, but. A couple of little kids showed up and they wanted to go out and catch a big wave. <laughs> Not today, son. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, so there is some humor when things happen, but little kids want to surf the big wave, you know. There's yeah. an amazing image of uh, me working, uh, and I shared that with you earlier, Tiki. Um, I was at the Civic Center, the shelter there, and um, one of the disaster workers was very concerned about this big, Big burly man. He must have been about 350, 6'4, huge man. And he was very concerned. He said, When you go out and talk with him, he, says, uh, he was standing right outside the building. And uh, I remember he, he said, We should get, have him go away. And I said, 
I don't know, no. He, he lost his house, which was under the bridge, just like everybody else that lost their houses. He needs to be able to come into the shelter. So I went in to go talk to him. But before I had the opportunity to do that, leech, oh my God. <laughs> um, uh, before I had the opportunity to do that, a little, um, like four-year-old came by, this big burly man, and took a hold of his pink oh. and let him in. To, to the shelter. I will ne that image I will never forget. That little four year old was not scared of this big bird man that looked terrifying and just brought him into the shelter. And so I have that image in my head. Oh, <laughs> oh my god. Um, some of these people I haven't seen for like twenty years. But in the end, um, the only other thing I was gonna say, I was so touched by the community because um, I think that was the beginning of us looking at homelessness and how we can support everybody, the fabric of everybody here in this county. And the other thing I was touched by was the tent cities, and that doesn't mean homeless cities. That's where all downtown, three or four um, stores would come together and they would work under the same tent and they would provide um, their services or sell their goods. And that created such a fabric of the community working together and all the partners that we have now, um, not just with Red Cross, but with helping each other. And that sticks with me in my mind in terms of Red Cross response, but also in terms of our community banding together and their affordable plan. Can I follow up on that? Yeah. All the years we've been doing this, the one thing that is astounding most is that almost every time we go out, wherever the disaster is, it's a human nature part that comes together. Communities are amazing. There be sometimes in a community there's this faction here just doesn't get along with this faction, but I'll tell you what, when a disaster happens, they work together. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it's been one time we haven't seen that That's across right. the country. I don't, it's matter where it is. Yeah. It's one of the best parts of human nature that, that I've ever, ever encountered encountered. And uh, it's just a, it's a great thing to see because you're you're part of it and it's just a, it's a good thing. It's a good part of human nature. It is it's amazing. What keeps me in the red right cross Barbara. Okay. Well, I have to have quite a bit of disaster experience before the earthquake because I've been here for the 82 floods and I was a CPR instructor and whenever they needed people to be a nurse in the shelter, I go, what's a shelter? So I <laughs> but uh, over the years, I think I, I'm going to say it was a privilege to work. I've done a lots of work with the Red Cross disaster mostly, but some other things too. And the uh, uh, and I would take you with uh, you. You really like to be with the regular people, not at the administrative level. <laughs> and if I got to put a bandage on somebody, I was happy. But I wasn't so happy if it was a Red Cross person. But you know, I really have enjoyed it, and I re I wish I could have gone on longer. But I, I uh, as being a supervisor, I always used to say, oh. Uh, I hope they're not coming because what am I going to do with them? You know, and I didn't want to be <laughs> So uh, I was at 9 11 in New York for 70 some days, and I said, that's just about enough for Karen. So I really, really think it was a privilege to work though, with the chapter, with the, with the whole community of the Red Cross. So I'd like to include Lee in our discussion. This is Lee Duffins. Can we go and do his introduction? <laughs> Bring him in. Lee was um, my incoming board chair during the earthquake. He um, he asked someone, or he asked me, how long, um, what kind of time commitment are you asking? <laughs> you know, I'm sure it's happened to you. You know, what's a call? Well, maybe, yes, you know, once a month, eight hours, maybe a month or whatever. And then his first experience was probably 36 hours straight. So. You learned <laughs> just like everyone else, trial by fire. Yeah. And... So, Lee, she's asking us to. Do you want to ask him? Okay. Yeah. Um, Lee, can you just tell us how long you've lived in Santa Cruz and then what you were doing during the earthquake? Okay. Uh, I've been here 51 years. Uh, and I was in my office at the university when the earthquake hit. and. Uh, under the desk, <laughs> um, and my first impulse was to make sure my the people I reported to me uh, were okay, and one was not okay, apparently. So I got her home, and then I went home, 
and not having really no awareness of the, in, the full impact of what had happened. Uh, because on our part of the, our side of the city, things seemed fairly normal. There was, you know, you could see chimneys had come down, but uh, it wasn't, it didn't strike me that we were in the middle of a major disaster. <clears throat> um, and it was a Tuesday night, and on Tuesday nights, uh, another couple joined my wife and I, Emily and I, for a kind of a quick informal uh, dinner because two of us, Caroline Keller, who was the uh, principal of Santa Cruz High at the time, and I would go off to uh, a rehearsal for the Cabrillo Chorus. So it was a quick supper, and uh, but, uh, Caroline didn't show up. <laughs> And um, that's because she was trying to get everything under control of Santa Cruz High. So then I think a little bit later in the evening, or not too much later, I probably called Carol and said, Do you need any help down there? <laughs> <laughs> and that, that sort of began an interesting journey with Red Cross. Um, we spent, uh, where's the old conference table? Uh, we spent several nights under the table that used to be in this room, which was a very substantial table. This was very substantial. Uh, because we weren't quite sure what was this, how sturdy this building was, but this was the room we camped out in for a few days. Um, when I when I arrived here that evening, uh, Thelma Dahlman was, Making sandwiches, supervising a group of women making sandwiches. I film just passed uh, away, I don't know, maybe six months ago this year. But uh, I knew her, and uh, so she put me to work, you know, making sandwiches, and I was quite content with that. But then Carol, I think, <laughs> came over and said, No, 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 no. You're supposed to be at the front door. <laughs> the front door. Well, because people are going to be arriving with checks and money and food and clothing and all kinds of things. And you need to be there to, as a chapter chair, to uh, thank them and acknowledge them. The, the, one of the interesting ironies in this whole thing is that just in, a pro, in a July of uh, 80, 80, I went to a chapter chairman orientation meeting, training session. Rick, you've probably been to those. Um, in San Luis Obispo. And um, there was no, in that whole weekend, I think it was a kind of a three day affair, and there was no reference at all to what the role of the chapter chairman was in a, in a major disaster. So I was completely ill equipped for that. It was learning on the job, and Carol knew exactly how to. Get me in the right place at the right time. Exactly. And that's where I met you yeah. and Bonnie, and it was good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> and Nancy emerged out of that. Uh, have you told your story yet? <laughs> okay. Joy, um, that's the thing. <laughs> I think for those of us who were here in the chapter that night and stuff, we didn't know we were the Elvis mentor. And I yeah. think that was probably true of right. you all. Yeah. We all thought San Francisco, because once we got the generator on, we could see, you know, the, the World Series, those pictures that everyone saw around the world. So we thought we were just small potatoes in the big scheme of things. <laughs> and I do remember setting up the shelters and being on the phone with Gary Smith and Watsonville, trying to figure out where to set up the shelters. Shelters, uh, what would make sense there? And then I also remember Gary saying, "But people aren't willing to get into the shelter. We need to have tents." I remember doing all those logistics because at that point in time, the chapter didn't have a disaster director. There were no disaster directors. There was just us. Um, so we had a really wonderful cadre of uh, uh, administrative level volunteers who made a lot of decisions kind of just by our best guesses at the time. And it wasn't until about four days later, or maybe two days later, we started getting some local uh, Red Cross national help in. And then finally we got the American Red Cross National Disaster Director here in Santa Cruz with us. And then everything worked so much better. <laughs> so. so we, um, and everyone, we mentioned a good point of not realizing how significant the earthquake was while it was happening. Can you briefly tell me 
whether or not you recognized how significant it was, and if not, at what point did you realize, oh, this is a big deal? I think when, for me, when we began seeing images of the Bay Bridge, I think that's where it really hit me. We were kind of all day inside, yeah. and it was kind of surreal, you know. Yeah. But um, one, one other little funny story, and Jim will appreciate this. Uh, at some point, I think night off was the first night, but maybe the second day, um, and I we had stayed here all night. Um, someone came to me and said, "There's a." Uh, reporter on the, the phone wanted, they were asking for lead office. And I, so I went to the phone and somebody introduced themselves. I, I can't remember now what network it was, but it was a you know, national network. And uh, we want to patch you into a conversation or something, was the story. So I held the phone and I held the phone. And it seemed like forever. And I finally said, oh, I phone didn't work. And I just hung up. And um, later I had phone calls from friends who had been listening to the radio <laughs> all across the country <laughs> <laughs> who wondered what had happened to lead up us because, uh -huh. you know, it went silent. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So uh, there were moments where I probably didn't do what I was supposed to <laughs> with the national press attention. <laughs> I remember sitting with uh, Gary Patton downtown, and they were trying to do a satellite feed for Nightline. And so we sat there, and we sat there, and we sat there. And you know, there was so much more to do, so yeah. I sit there. Uh, but, but so I'm sitting there with Gary, and he's like, and, and, and then they never got us patched in. So it, there were a lot of things like that, where we waited on the phone, or we waited. But I do remember, um, at the very end of the mall walk, and the president pulled away, and one of the press people came up to us and said, can one of your volunteers take this? And they had like an old film canister with a film in it to the other side of the mall, and it was CNN. And it was the CNN tape of us all walking the mall, and I gave it to one of my volunteers, and he ran it over to the other side, over by Longs and stuff. And, uh, and then I went to get the $100,000 donation at the bank, <laughs> I think maybe with you, Lee, and it was on TV. It was showing on TV us, and I think that's what I, you know, that's the whole presidential thing sort of ramped it up for me. And, um, and realized we were sort of part of history. And my aunt called me from Nova Scotia and, and seen my picture in the paper. Oh, so, wow. I, yeah, wow. And, and um, what, I, what I was trying to remember was, I think I saw Highway 17 and I saw the mountain fall on Highway 17 and I heard there'd been a casualty. And I think at that point I went, oh no, I also, uh, there was a bookstore the bookstore it was who kept on looking for somebody who was still underground. Robin. Robin. Yeah. Yeah. Robin or and teams. I yeah. remember uh, we almost we lost five or six people there at the Watsonville person that we lost. It was like suddenly, oh my God, we've got all these deaths. And then it became, it became real to me. And we couldn't get people out from the road. And the lady in Ford who lost her leg, it was like, for a department store was suddenly like all the damage to people, not just the fabric of things, but the people. I think that hit me. And then I went, oh my God, it's much bigger than me. So. That's what I, Lee and I worked together at the Santa Cruz at the time. Uh, this was how they, he had a leadership role. Well, it's called Student Services now, it was a student affairs so, uh, I was in communications. So. That I mentioned earlier, I was in the carriage house, which performed oh, beautifully. <laughs> and uh, but when I started going back home, I that's well, I remember going out to the carriage house parking lot, and there was a fire that had broken out. You probably remember this, Rick, that on Myrtle Street. It was a, a yeah, an old wooden house that had just. I'm not sure exactly why, but it completely burst into flames. And so that we could overlook the town, we could look over the town in, in that parking lot. And, uh, and I remember seeing all the smoke from the downtown area. And I thought, wow, well, well, this is, maybe this is more severe than I realize. And 
snake my way in my my old Volkswagen bug down through the through the downtown. So all these chimneys in driveways that that amped it up. And then I think as I mentioned earlier, I happened to take a route that just drove me right by Ford's department store, and um, it was still the downtown hadn't been cordoned off yet, but um, would be I think by that evening probably. And, and they were literally carrying people bloodied from the quake outside of Ford's department store. And then I think it was at that moment that I really started really fully appreciating the severity of it here. Yeah, it's probably in the same, same boat as Jim. I, once I got into the downtown, you know, being in, you know, in the earthquake and outside that environment, you know, like many of us, I just, you know, secured the home, made sure the family was okay, and then, and then left and didn't return for days, just knowing that they were, that, that they were, you know, in good hands and had the, the supplies necessary. But once I got into the downtown and checked in, you know, I was into a, a rescue mode initially, as I mentioned, at the top of the mall. So looking for Robin Ortiz, um, and, and the rescue efforts that, that we were doing was basically, you know, here's here's some gloves, here's a outdated fire helmet, uh, start moving brick. And so we're going in and out moving brick, aftershocks are still going, walls are coming in, so we're running out at the time. And then people, uh, and, and the citizens of, of our community, were kind of converging on the downtown and they were all helping as well. They all wanted to help. They all wanted us to keep on digging. Exactly. And, um, that's when it, it became a little difficult to manage and there were safety issues for those community members that weren't necessarily equipped to be in that environment. And that's when a decision was made to start locking the downtown down uh, from just general public access and focus on just rescuing uh, you know, those that you know, were still missing. And I think in the end, we had three fatalities in the downtown. Robert Ortiz being one, I think she was probably the last to be extracted, um, which is, you know, where the protest came in too. You know, we went from natural disaster mode to uh, protest, uh, you know, public unrest mode because we weren't digging uh, continually for uh, for Robert Ortiz, and then the presidential visit, and then uh, uh, to top it all off, I think the uh, weather was probably uh, unseasonably warm uh, mm -hmm. at that time, and we were in a full like uh, Indian summer heat wave mode. So that was kind of compounding you know, all, all the issues as well. So it was, uh, when I got into that downtown on that first evening and saw the devastation and checked in with the, the fire staff that were already, you know, set up and, and checking in first responders, I realized, yeah, this is kind of a big deal, a lot bigger than I thought. Because driving in, I don't, rec I don't recall a path really being hindered. You know, I was coming in from Aptos. But once I got into the downtown and saw the devastation firsthand, that's, a, you know, there's still smoke, uh, you know, still, you know, people sirens going because they're they're rushing people out. You know, to triage locations. Um, you know, then you realize uh, this is this is a bigger deal, and this is going to have lasting changes to the to the community, and, and ultimately it, it did, and, and the culture of the community. You know, I was watching an old VHS tape that I had shot of things that I wanted to remember from the earthquake. And I had for, I've, I've forgotten about the protests, you know, uh, about the, the protests that occurred for you all who were doing, trying to find bodies and hopefully find them while the people were still alive. And that the people had wanted the rescuers to just work around the clock. And, and you all had given yourself a little break and that had caused great upset and there would be people gathering outside the coffee roasting company to protest and, and first to scream at you and it was, I'd forgotten all about that. Yeah, there was a, literally a, a crowd that broke through the line at Cedar and Cathcart and you know now we've gone from you know rescue mode to you know protest <laughs> mode. We got a line, we're trying to keep people out of the downtown. They break through the line, you know, we're tackling and arresting people now for, you know, for rioting. It was, uh, it was, it was a fairly chaotic scene. Uh, to say the least. 
Well, what I was also going to say is the first responders were working in danger themselves because you kept on having to after them after them. and having to run away and keep on coming back. And, did the and then job. having your own impact at home yeah. too yeah. with your yeah. family. Yeah. What I what I remember about it is what you know what you guys were saying about the wonderful cycle of communities coming together. That certainly happens in the first about three days, and then after about three days, people get into that kind of cranky mode. They realize that this is a long term thing. They start to get sick. I mean, I saw that with our staff. Our staff was heroic for days, and then people started to, you know, they got headaches. They they started crying uncontrollably. We. We were really fortunate to get from the county some mental health workers and we could pull our staff together. And I remember all of the staff just sitting in here and with a mental health worker and giving everyone permission to say, you know, this is really hard. And then go back out there and look really brave. So, I, you know, I do think it took a toll on everybody and I think it cycled into a lot of um, discontent and feeling helplessness before people finally resolved it and did their recovery. That's pretty consistent with many critical yeah, incidents. Is, you know, literally have to force that those dedicated staff to, to, to step away, right. to take time away, and then just right. and just recharge because they won't. Otherwise, yeah. you literally have to order them to, to leave the line somewhere. Well, that's why mental health was so important because I don't think we all recognized it until somebody told us. And I and even like I remember we had a guy Jack Meehan, and he was a wonderful volunteer with us, and he was with us twenty four seven. His wife Brenda had all sorts of mental health issues as a result of the earthquake, and Jack couldn't stop to help her. And so we sent a mental health worker in, and he never, never forgot that because it made such a difference to him in his life. So, you know, I think we all have to remember that whenever there's a disaster to just take time. I think, just to say, mental health wasn't even set up as a part. Was right. under the nursing, who, which knew a little bit about it, knew a lot about it. Once we found that the mental health really made a big difference, yes, yes. Yeah. So not, and not just on the community, but on our staff. Right. Very, very important. Yeah. And for Santa Cruz County Behavioral Health, to actually have that in play back then. Yeah, I mean, I mean that that, that should be applauded. I mean, Wasn't think about it, it. Called helping ordinary people cope helping with emergencies. Cope, helping ordinary people cope. With emergencies, yeah, That's Project, Project, Project Hope. Hope, which I thought um, was such an extraordinary name. It for. started in '81 because we had floods and we had fatalities, mm -hmm. and this wonderful, crazy nurse, remember Abby, mm -hmm. came yeah. and trained, cross-trained <laughs> mental health people. <laughs> <laughs> no, we were crazy. She was amazing because she. We're was, talking '80s right now. Okay. <laughs> she, came, she came and trained us in '81 to respond, and she had 28 mental health workers, clinicians, licensed, skipping around the building because she wanted us to do LMA, large muscle activity, because you have to have balance to the mental health part. To the emotional part, you need to have physical balance. And so all of our clients were looking out the window at us. <laughs> so I remember her, and then Karen and I started this small little mental health group, um, Red Cross, before National started in 91. And, but we were, um, I had the amazing opportunity of having been trained, cross trained. So we had an MOU with Kelly Mental Health. I wore both hats. I was on the board with Lee and I was dealing with uh, mental health with Project Cope, uh, being the clinical director of that. It's great, an amazing experience. Um, well, I think just in reflecting with this room, uh, you know, that event was a, was a game changer for uh, everybody in here in so many ways, uh, which is reflective of. The, the Santa Cruz community as a whole. It, it really changed uh, the culture, it, it changed the environment, um, and I think it uh, really um, it, it really changed our, I think, all of our perspectives on community and service in a lot of ways, and what, what community really means. And I think, uh, you know, everyone reflecting on how the communities have come together in the other critical instance of disaster that they have seen, um, I think, was really reflected in our uh, disaster response here in Santa Cruz County in 1989. So, um, you know, it, it, it changed the community in, in some ways uh, for the better and hopefully, you know, at the end of this, when we look back at our response and our time you know, it, around that disaster, that we, we look at, at, at the positives that, that really came from it for, for us individually and in the community as a whole. And it was a tough time. I'd like to follow up real quick on that. Not only did it 
make a difference in this community, but as we travel around the country, this chapter should be very proud of what it has done since I've been involved and previously before I was involved. The steadfast uh, commitment to the Red Cross principles. And I'll tell you what, we around the country, oh, another person from Santa Cruz, we are very well known around the country uh, in disasters. So a lot of what's happened since the 89s I was involved, uh, I've seen the, the Save and Well program come. You said the people outside there, well, what happened to you? What's going on there? Save and Well's uh, developed, uh, which is very important, but there's a lot in Patsy Cosco. It's <laughs> probably the most instrumental person that I know of. If she asked, we would go. And we do. And we don't even smile if she asks you because that means a yes. <laughs> so, again, the steadfastness comes from the leadership from previous to Patsy, from Patsy to where we are today. And I'm very proud of this organization, and a lot of people around the country recognize that we have that kind of commitment. So. And for Carol and Lee, I mean, nobody saw any deficiencies that you guys may have had in your response initially. I know you guys, you know, we're, we're, we're breathing a, 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 a sigh of relief when National came in with their disaster coordinator, but uh, none, none of us that were the recipients of the aid saw any uh, any deficiencies uh, in your response from our end. Uh, as ad hoc as it may have been or maybe it may have felt for you guys, uh, your response is, is more than admirable, so thank you. Do you think the earthquake impacted the Santa Cruz community? <laughs> I know. Minor details. It's a loaded question. How about it? Um, well, yeah, it impacted our family tremendously. Uh, uh, the, the days after the earthquake, just gathering together, we had we had a granddaughter that said, so, well, "How are you doing? How are you feeling?" She says, "I don't know." I, I, I think I'm going to move. So, I think she asks, where are you going to move to? I don't know, maybe maybe Hawaii or New York City, but I don't want to be here. <laughs> <laughs> she was six. She was six, but she's been camping in her backyard. She did not like the, the fact. Yeah. So it impacted not only adults, but children, I'm sure, uh, you know, uh, was affected a great deal by it. And I'm sure they forgot about it. But uh, you, you begin to reevaluate after something like that immediately afterwards your faith in you know, certain ways, uh, what you believe in, and uh, it did affect me a great deal. And I had, I had a lot more faith after the earthquake in, because of the involvement with Red Cross and what I saw, the outpouring of, of just what people could do after an earthquake. So I had a lot more faith in the community now, and I uh, got a lot more involved in the community. So it did have a huge community impact for me in that, in that respect. I think economically too. You know, a lot of people, like Lyle said, um, you know, his granddaughter who was six, you know, wanted to move. And I think there was a lot of people that did move. They went to other states and, you know, the real estate market, you know, plummeted and that. And so you saw, you know, that change. And then those folks then decided they didn't want to live in, you know, Nevada or wherever, it might, Arizona or wherever they may have gone. And then try to come back a few years later and the real estate market picked back up. And then they couldn't come back. Yeah. You know, and I think that, you know, looking at, you know, housing situations and things like that, it did change, you know, this community a lot. Sure. You know, homelessness and, you know, I think people that were most at risk became even more at risk. You know, um, people didn't have earthquake insurance, you know, and we saw so many homes downtown Watsonville that came off of their foundations, you know, and what it took, you know, to bring those homes back. and. You would see, you know, three families living together, you know, and that, and in a situation that probably wasn't safe, you know, and so that's one thing that we do at the Red Cross now is we're out doing, you know, preparedness talks and making sure people understand what it takes to be safe, you know. So we lost ten thousand homes. Lee might have a perspective on this because we both work at UC Santa Cruz. 1,000 students, and I, re I remember thinking at the time that, uh, and hearing this from people in downtown, because the downtown people, the small businesses down there were in such a precarious situation. It was, in many cases, their, their, uh, you know, their shops had been damaged to the point of not being able to be occupied. In fact, 
fact, just the whole downtown was closed, so they got all these tents yes. or whatever they were. Pavilions, I guess. Yeah. And, um, and the community really pulled together to try to support the local merchants because people were just barely hanging on. Was, you know, Christmas, was, the Christmas yeah. holidays yeah. were approaching, which for a lot of those people might have represented more than half of their yeah. income during the year. And, um, and it, it, the, just a little slice of it I remember from UC Santa Cruz was UC Santa Cruz and the community had always been kind of a little bit at odds in terms of the town gown conflict and probably are again. But, but at the time, the merchants downtown really appreciated the fact that UC Santa Cruz existed because it was 10,000 people that were willing to regularly come into the downtown and spend money. And that became really a, kind of a pivotal, kind of a positive turn in the relationship mm -hmm. between the university and downtown. I remember that. Yeah. You know, the, the housing thing has come up. Um, oh, yeah. One of the good things that came out of the earthquake was the fact that, you know, the Red Cross raised more money than was really needed to pay for the, for the, tr the traditional, conventional disaster response. And um, the, uh, was it Moscone was the mayor? San Francisco was on it. Whoever you know uh, uh, made a big thing about you know the money was donated for this part of the country and it's going to stay here, and because there was a little tussle going on between the national and the community, and uh, the money did stay here. I, I ended up being part of a. I can't remember what the acronym It's called prepared people. Uh, there was a We had a we had like. We really did a good job of accounting for our money here in Santa Cruz. Yeah. So we knew how much we took in from local people. So when they were divvying up that money, we had our money we to do. spend. And we had a that um, National came up with a really interesting grid of how to invest that money right. in a whole lot of long term recovery things right. and uh, across the board. And Lee was part of a committee that decided what projects we fund in Santa Cruz. And we got a lot of well, um, all seven counties. Yeah, but, but specifically, yeah. Yeah. We, uh, and I, the replacement housing fund was the one that I, I got a call from that about a year ago asking if we would finally release the money because they had recycled it so many times. <laughs> they wanted to know, did the Red Cross want that money back? Yeah. Yeah. And they couldn't find anyone to ask anymore except me. So, um, but I think that project had a lot of longevity that. Oh, it did. Yeah, I couldn't find, there is a report on it, I could not find it. Right, one, yeah, and if Julie had come. But, but I, why don't you just talk about that one, because how it worked. Well, um, <clears throat> I think it was mostly through the housing authorities in each county, it was kind of organizationally how it worked, because that's where I met Mary James for the first time out here on 41st Avenue, and now they're back there on 41st Avenue. Um, and the... The, the communities the, the, through the counties made uh, working with working with contractors, building contractors, um, put together proposals for replacement housing, and the, most of the Red Cross money went to what were called bridge loans. It was the construction loan to enable the contractor to get move, to get moving and get the thing up and and, uh, and finish. Uh, so that money was recycled a number of times. I think there was only one bad debt, only one that was not returned out of Alameda County, but in every other county, all that money came back and was recycled again. I had a call maybe, oh, probably 10 years ago now, from the city of Santa Cruz, because there was a chunk of money sitting in the city coffers, and there was a proposal that somebody was, a uh, council person was proposing to take it out of that, put it into something else. And uh, I, uh, I think it was Mike Rockman who called me. And I said, well, Mike, you know, it's just a question of when. It's not a question of if it's going to happen again. You better hold on to that money. <laughs> so I hope that's what they did. I didn't follow that trail. But, uh, so there's a little bit of money still sitting in Santa Cruz. And I remember that once we did those bridge loans for the new housing that came online, that the, 
the proviso was that they would uh, set aside a certain amount of that housing uh, for disaster relief victims. Right, right. So right. that helped us get people back in housing. Right. And we set up, I think, almost two years of work with prepared information to make sure that, that the community would be prepared for another disaster, and that was invaluable. Yeah, there were a lot of good things that came out yeah. that were innovative. It right, was I mean, that, we no really set the bar on that yeah. kind of recovery yeah. effort, which, yeah. um, you know, in many ways, I think the earthquake changed, well, it changed, it changed the chapter it. forever because. The way we all responded and the way that we got national to respond um, really changed the whole relief effort, which is, I think, why we have such a good reputation because that started the building of it. And we, you know, it, it's wonderful that we have longevity. I mean, that Patsy's still there, that you guys are still there. I mean, that was the nice thing about Santa Cruz. Nobody ever really left us. <laughs> you know, they had to stay with us. So there was a lot of continuity. Well, Carol, you had a saying that you, nobody ever really leaves unless you leave a nice gift. Right, you know, but, and, and even then, if you pass, you that, could leave a plan. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the gift that keeps giving. So this is kind of an aside. Was anybody in Watsonville, or did anyone respond in Watsonville um, after the earthquake? Because, I mean, if Santa Cruz gets overshadowed by San Francisco, Watsonville often gets overshadowed by Santa Cruz. Was anyone in Watsonville or? So I was in Watsonville. And I was not during the earthquake, the actual earthquake, but I responded after. Okay. So the way it worked though, um, I, I, right before the earthquake in 1988, Watsonville had been its own Red Cross chapter and Santa Cruz had been its own Red Cross chapter. And so we merged just in the beginning of 89. Okay. So we really didn't have as much traction in Watsonville as we should have because the the chapter there really wasn't as functional. And so, you know, that was a big hole for us because we had, um, we didn't have as many robust volunteers there. And it was during that election too where they were changing the whole uh, city council in Watsonville and making it much more of a Latino council. And that election happened in November of that year. So there was a lot of unrest going on in Watsonville and feeling like the council was not representative of the community. Yep. Yeah. All right. Someone touched on disaster preparedness. <laughs> and this, I might modify the question a little bit for this group because this may be a poor assumption on my part, but I'm guessing all of you have an emergency kit. <laughs> that must be some sort of like standard of Red Cross employee um, or volunteer. Um, can you talk about? personal emergency preparedness and community emergency preparedness and what that looks like, what that means, um, just sort of open it up to the floor. I think Patsy is going to be best to talk about. I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, personal preparedness, of course I was not prepared uh, October 1789. Um, I learned a lot. Um, I learned a lot from Carol. <laughs> Um, and her being my mentor over the years. Um, but personal preparedness is something that I um, work towards all the time. Um, I had three small children um, at the time. They're all adults now, and they're also very prepared. Um, since then, I have a um, young granddaughter who is in a wheelchair, so that we even make special provisions for her preparedness and what she needs. Uh, including the school she goes to, the transportation, everything that revolves around uh, personal preparedness for us. Uh, everyone has a role. Everyone knows what to do. Uh, we had to evacuate. And, uh, what all it needs, it needs a village, right, to just take care of the one child that um, has special needs. Um, and then taking that and uh, teaching the community as well about how to be prepared, especially um, our vulnerable neighborhoods that live paycheck to paycheck. Um, that when you talk about the list of things that they need to prepare for and have, you see that look on their face, like I can barely afford to put food on the table for my kids, right? So we talk about how other ways to be prepared, how some of our partners, you know, um, if you let them know, they provide extra provisions like the food bank, right, or the pantries in the area. Um, it, so things like this, um, how do, through other partners, whether it's National Night Out, we all do a lot of preparedness year-round because we need to. 
this community, uh, right after 89, I think we had 17 presidentially declared disasters, and then since then more, right? So um, we have to be prepared for everything. It's the general preparedness presentation, but from there we touch on the hazards in the area. Not to scare anyone, because you know we want people to come here, live here, we live in paradise, but it also is the reality of what we live in, right? And then teaching our businesses. A lot of businesses don't bounce back. I mean, we lost quite a few after 89 because there wasn't a plan, didn't have a way of recouping. The good thing about all the money that came in was helping sustain the community again, right? Investing back in the community, and that's what helped people get back on their feet again. But teaching our business partners as well about how to be prepared. Continuity planning. Mm -hmm. Some personal preparedness stuff that I think we all learned during the earthquake, for me the first one, was always keep your car full. Because remember, none of us could get gas. Um, so we couldn't do our stuff without the gasoline. So that was important. And I also learned to keep stuff in the trunk of my car. Um, heavy shoes, bottle of water, flashlight, and just keep it there all the time. Because, you know, when it happens, you could be in the middle of nowhere. So in addition to stuff at home, so. And never put your first aid kit in the closet, because guess what, if there's <laughs> another earthquake, everything falls on top of you and find it fast enough. As far as being prepared, uh, the only physical place to be prepared for an earthquake or any disaster, but one of the most important things for me is to be mentally prepared for any kind of disaster and making connections with the people that you could trust rely on so you have a mental picture of something happens you right away know where you can make connections you right away know where first of all families first uh, but so you have to be mentally I think prepared is one of the most important things then you do the physical things around you too but be mentally prepared because they do happen they quite often and have make sure you have a contact list of the people that are closest to yes. you your doctors um, your medications handy with you and also a plan of where you're going to reunite with your family. That is so important. What if an emergency happens at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, your kids are still in school or some whatever, playing soccer, how do you get a hold of them? How do you reach, what's a reunification place? So one thing that we learned in the 89 earthquake is a lot of people's animals um, bolted and we had a big backyard in Felton and we were picking up dogs left and right and then people were saying, oh that's my dog. And we are like, well how do we know? People were coming in, we had this beautiful chocolate lab that five people said was belonged to them. Oh, oh. But we went, the dog did not respond in the way, so my dad says, okay, call your dog's name and I'll see what they do. So we had go bags for our animals. Somebody gave me a beta last month for my birthday and my boyfriend's like, what are you gonna do? I said, I already have a go bag for my beta. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, see this giant Ziploc bag that's gonna fit to this container, we just zip it up and we can go. I have that for my dog, so, and pictures of my dog and People don't realize in Santa Cruz County you have to register your animals. And if you register with the SPCA and you get that uh, chip in them, if they get lost, you can reunite them because a lot of people do not have their animals afterwards. And it broke my heart that some of, some people were just looking and looking for their animals. And living in the San Lorenzo Valley, they could be anywhere or they could have passed because of all the mountain lanes that we have. So you have to be prepared for everything. I'll tune this up for. Michelle, who just did an interview on this uh, with one of the local TV stations, but the Red Cross speaks of it as get a kit, make a plan, stay informed. And we talked a little bit about the kit and a little bit about the plan, but you also have to figure out, you have to anticipate that you're going to maybe need ways to stay informed during an emergency. And you know, one of my favorites and is just having a little portable radio with <laughs> with batteries in it. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's the batteries may not last that long, but it will maybe get you through the first few days, and you can pick up the local AM or FM station. And a lot of times, my recollection is that KSCO radio, which is an AM station in town during the earthquakes, did a really good job of just trying to provide. Know, up to each the, the tower stayed up and, yeah. and you had that was really our way of getting news at the time. So, so I heard the appeal from the Red Cross being uh, bilingual uh, people to help translate 
I called the number and the first thing they asked me is how quick can you get down here? And uh -huh. I only lived at 30th and Romer, so I hadn't seen outside uh, a few minutes. It took me almost two hours to get here because when I started getting on the roads, the roads buckled up. Uh, Capitola Road and you know being rerouted and Capitola Extension and it was a nightmare. I think people can't imagine sometimes. Uh, I know I was certainly in this case in, in this position in 1989 that you're not going to necessarily have water. You won't have access. You know there wasn't water. I can't remember exactly whether the because the power was out the water plant in Santa Cruz stopped, but. We didn't have water for the first 24 hours. And I remember ending up going out, just driving around the community looking for a, some place that was open where I could get water for my family. We didn't even have running water for six weeks, I think we had it because of the news or something. You know, I think we all forget the technology too. I remember we didn't have cell phones, we right. had to use M radios. And I remember some people had a cell phone and it was like a shoe. A we had it was like this huge shoebox that they carried around with like them. And, 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 and we yeah. had never had a fax machine here. And so um, people donated fax machines to us and it was in that corner and none of us knew how to use it. <laughs> and, and we'd be in the middle of meetings and it would start spewing out papers like in this huge roll. And it was like, it scared us all. None of us knew what it meant. And I remember the Apple folks came over here and said, uh, and they volunteered for a day and they helped us put all the cases in the computers. And that was just pretty revolutionary for us then. Because we, we, I think we had one or two computers that we kept in the other room that a few people used. I mean, it was a really a different era. I think one thing too, in talking about being prepared, is with an earthquake, you don't know that it's coming. You know, whereas when you have a hurricane and you know other sorts of natural disasters, you know a flooding event and that you have a few days, you know, to get your head around. Okay, this might be happening. I can get my belongings together. You know, put a kit together if you don't have a kit. And I think that's one thing for our community to really be aware of is the importance of having a preparedness kit ready to go. You know, at your home, not inside of your home, but in a place that you can access. You know, if your home was. You know, to be inaccessible and that and having a kit in your car because you know during an earthquake it you don't know that it's going to happen you know we have this thing where we say we have earthquake weather but you know that's probably not a real thing but anyways it's just um we have to always be prepared you know one great thing that the red cross is doing is this pillowcase project where you know we're educating you know school age children you know and that and going in and talking about a disaster and being prepared and they get a little pillowcase that has you know a Disney character on it and it has a flashlight or a teddy bear and they color it in and they are being taught the importance of being prepared and then they're going home and telling their family members look at what I got at school today and let's talk about our plan and that and so we're hoping you know to come at it from all angles and making sure that our community has the information and the tools that they need you know during a disaster as well as our monthly uh, home fire alarm installations that we offer the communities free. Um, our volunteers also go in and help make uh, a plan, talk to them about the hazards in their area. Um, so that's really important as well. Got to have an escape plan. Sometimes you don't bust it to an escape It's not like there were a lot of stores that were open after the earthquake. I remember finding the, it's not there anymore, but the old, it used to be called Community Foods. Yes. It was a little health food store, one of the first health food stores in Santa Cruz. And I'm on the east side there, and they happened to be open the day after the earthquake. And you should have seen the line. Uh, they were they were letting like five people in at a time because nobody was prepared. Nobody had food. They were, you know, you'd go in there and buy water. So it's not like you're going to go to your neighborhood store necessarily. My boyfriend at the time was got right out of high school. So he was working at Deluxe Foods over in Santa Cruz. And so I went over there the day after the earthquake and helped them clean up and because they had people, you know, wanting to come in. And I remember being in there and food all over the aisles and that, but just getting water and batteries and things and getting it organized so that, you know, all the perishable stuff we were throwing out. And, and that's it. it was just spilled everywhere. Yeah. And Nick Pagnini and Felton, they had a little market there, and we would line up, and he gave you a little flipboard, 
and you would write down what you needed, signed it, and he wouldn't take any of your money. He says, you need the money, there's no ATMs working right now, keep your cash, come back in a couple of days when the lights come on and you can pay, pay us then. Mm -hmm. And they would say, okay, just ask for everything. And so we were with my dad standing in line, I was 17 at the time, and then all of a sudden they started handing us our stuff and then but, uh, containers of ice cream. Anything that was frozen was coming home with you. So you have like, I didn't ask for this. I don't like this. It's like you're taking it home with you. <laughs> and then my family had just come from cost, from Price Club, mm -hmm. so over the hill. And my family had the food, but we didn't have the tent. And my neighbors next door had the tents, but no food. And they had six kids. And my mom said, "Let's just uh, park, uh, have it parked and a party in the middle of our driveway. And you guys bring out your stuff, and we'll bring out our stuff." And we we had a nice little. Um, get together and that's one of the things up in the San Lorenzo Valley because if you're thinking Watsonville um, was overshadowed by Santa Cruz the San Lorenzo Valley got nothing and we had a lot of damage when I was in Ben Lomond I my study uh, hall was in Ben Lomond and I was coming to Felton normally it takes maybe nine minutes to get there it took us almost an hour because we had to go over bridges you don't realize how many bridges are in the San Lorenzo Valley until <laughs> you can't go over one because one looks like it has a crack and um, my tutor had to take me back home because I was 17 and my parents happened to take my keys away. I can't remember what I did, but <laughs> I didn't have my car, which I'm glad because I don't think I could have driven home. But we had to drive around and find places. And at one point, my tutor said, close your eyes. And he said, why? He goes, because you're a rule follower and you're not going to like what I'm going to do. <laughs> and we had to go over a bridge that had been... Um, deemed not crossable, but he says, I need to get you home because you're crying way too hard for me. And so I got home, and it was the best thing. My parents were there. They didn't know what, because we didn't have ways of communicating. And they knew that they needed to get me home, and it was the best reunion ever. And um, later, Valerie, you were amazing that day. You took care of me, and you helped me take care of other people. And And it just made me want to come and be a Red Cross volunteer later on when I had the opportunity to work with Patsy. Patsy was the one who talked me into being a Red Cross volunteer, and I'm just so thankful for um, being able to help our community and teach other people on how to be resilient. It's not being about scared, it's being prepared. And, um... You'd think after 30 years that things would be different, a disaster. Guarantee you that if another large disaster hits this area or anywhere in the Bay Area, there's still going to be total chaos. Oh, yeah. and, but what we try to do is to make order out of chaos. And I think this chapter is really good at that and how to do that. But it doesn't change the fact that communications, almost every aspect of our daily lives, will be impacted and affected. Like, say, the gas of the cars, so do the kits, do the whatever. You need to do that because. 30 years later, you think we'd be prepared for that kind of thing, but you, you're, not. you're not. We see it across the country. People, East Coast, they have hurricane after hurricane after hurricane. They're doing a better job of evacuations, that kind of thing, but it still impacts the neighborhoods and everything just as bad as it did 30 years ago. So in this area, for us to be prepared, is, and thank you, Patsy, for helping make that happen, that we were really as prepared as we can be with communications, with saving the well for, for people to know. Uh, when the earthquake happened here, there was you made one phone call. I think you were able to get one call out to your mom. Oh, I went to get my sister to make sure she was okay, and <clears throat> she she could see the phone through the window. She was outside, and she could see the phone. And her mom would just be beside herself. So she ran in the house really quick and threw the phone out the window. <laughs> <laughs> and we called. And she answered as the girl came out. Okay, and then the life of death. Yeah. 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 She had Eureka at the time, so there was only communication that, and then she could take information to the rest of the family. Mm -hmm. yeah. We didn't have sacred wealth at that time. It was yeah. like if she hadn't got that call out, they would not know for like, oh, no, no. But uh, you know, we can talk oh. about cell phones, but in a large disaster in an area, don't plan on your cell phone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We were asked to go down to Key West uh, after Irma. We drove this local Irma all the way to Florida. We the hurricane went over, went to Miami, and he said, you're one of five vehicles that are going to go to Key West. Nobody's been down there yet, so who's our supervisor? You don't have any, just go. <laughs> just take supplies and go. And there were no cell phones. All the cell phones were down. Verizon was down. Everyone was down. I mean, this is yeah. today. This is, you yeah. think. 
And it took, I think it was six days before finally the cell tower went up and we had some kind of communication, but it was devastating down there. So it doesn't change a disaster is a disaster, it is chaos. So we have to expect that, mentally prepare for it, and then look around and see what can we do and how fast we can make order out of this chaos. Mm -hmm. I think Red Cross does a pretty good job. Um, there's a wonderful uh, map that uh, Diane Myers, who used to work in the earthquake too, she's a nurse, an RN, and she said every community goes through uh, the emergency phase, which is the first 24 hours, the honeymoon phase, which is the next three to five days, and people are exhausted, and as Carol said, mm -hmm. anger sets in, that's where there's the most uh, child abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, uh, domestic abuse, because people are frustrated with things not being back to the normal. And that happens anywhere from uh, a week to six weeks. And then there's uh, the recovery phase, as all the agencies pull out, the people realize that they rely on themselves and they become more resilient. And then after recovery is reconstruction. And I feel like what happened with Santa Cruz is we went through the, the Carol has this map, the downtown was completely obliterated. All the, the buildings were gone. We had 10 cities, or what do you call them? Civilians. We had that section when we were in the recovery phase. And then now we go down to Pacific and we see these new buildings. You know, everything sort of regrows. It's never the way it used to be, but it's something new altogether. And we're stronger for it. And I feel like um, it's one of the things that I that I'm touched by is those of us who went through this are stronger for it. But so many Santa Cruzians now know and have the preparedness to do do that and can. And I think that's the resilience of the community. After you know, it took us ten years to rebuild the downtown, but now it's thirty years later. We couldn't tell we had. I think they're still putting in the last of the classic yeah. buildings. Yeah. 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 You know what? You know, you're probably right. They the are. bookshop Santa Cruz in the back is being rebuilt. That is true. It's true. Yeah. It's too bad they didn't finish it this year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It would have been it's nice by a 30th anniversary. Yeah. Of the, but, I mean, a community gets hard hit and it takes a long time to recoup. I, I will say, though, and this, uh, this, I'm sorry, this probably has nothing to do with the Red Cross or what it does. There was a spirit that I can't speak for Watson Law is more familiar with what happened in Santa Cruz, but there there was a spirit about rebuilding the downtown that was Vision. that was pretty positive. They had that whole yeah. Vision uh, envisioning Santa Cruz, yeah. Santa Cruz yeah. effort. And in fact, I was just watching uh, a replay of like Sandy Lydon's <laughs> talk that kicked off that series. Uh, Remember there were all those cardboard buildings of commission yes, people? Yes. We, my husband made a, a cardboard building, a possible reconstruction. I saw Charlie Eady is doing something about that um, okay. downtown, because he ended up the Mission Santa Cruz effort. Right. So he's talking about what that was like. Yeah. One of the beautiful things that Watsonville did is they had, which is a way of bringing the community together, one of the artists there said, let's each bring something that's broken that was from our house and put it into this huge mound of collage. So for years, there was this amazing sculpture of different pieces of broken things, it's sort of a thing of, we come out of the ashes, we come out of the horrendous event, and we've, we've put the fabric together, and here we are. So there was a representation of every single thing that happened, and people came that community place, and that was a community center for the book and piece of art, and seen the monument to have we built. Um, I really like that about Watson. So I have one last question. What's it like to reflect on your experience 30 years later? Do you want to just go around? Mm -hmm. Sure. I'll start with you. The wrong seat today. <laughs> 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 like I'm safe on the wrong seat. Hard. Hard. Why? Um. Because of injuries, because of losses. Um. Just hard. Yeah. Um. 
I just really can't uh, the difference between, I mean, what gain we've made like in the 30 years. Is that what you're uh, asking? More or less? More or less. Well, I think what we've talked about right here is preparedness is really been one of the percent jet from what we first started out 30 years ago. We didn't even have either, there was no cell phones, so you really had to rely on uh, your transportation. You didn't go anywhere with a half tank, you had a full tank, because that's the way it was. And, um, and we've learned how to take care of people, people who come into the shelter who are not well, uh, uh, emotionally and physically. And so we've learned to, uh, we, we learned to take care of people more and uh, their needs with our nurses and mental health. It's, uh, it's really, really leaps and bounds there. And we have people who come in, if you're in a shelter, teachers come in and volunteer their time for their, because they didn't want their students to go without their education. And so you get that from that section. And then you get other people coming in and wanting to bring, uh, they want to bring uh, toys and things in. And, uh, and uh, just things like that have helped to really help people. Yeah. They even donated like TV sets. <laughs> you know, you imagine, think that, you know, it's mostly for the ed adults too. <laughs> and uh, cause they have to be occupied too, you know. And we just made a lot of progress that way. And then in feeding, we made a lot of progress. You know, we get, we're getting it out there, we're setting up tables and uh, and doing our, uh, and do our feeding. Yeah, which is, people need that, really need that at this time. For me, I thought I had put it all in a nice little box and had put it away and didn't realize how the emotions can come up so quickly. I can feel them right here. Um, and so, yeah, that for me is that, that emotional part and just the, the flashbacks of just talking about it, about the, wow, I do remember this, and oh gosh, I remember this now. Um, and just feeling like it was yesterday. Um, and just, but just also being proud of what I've learned since then from 17 to 47, um, the, the change that I have made and the growth that has happened and how I'm now prepared and how I'm able to now teach my community, my Latino community, my San Lorenzo Valley community about what it is to survive and thrive. Um, my experience 30 years ago um, didn't have anything really to do with the Red Cross. I, but I'm fortunate now to be doing some part-time work for the Red Cross. And I think it's through that work that I really reconnected with the things about the earthquake that I remember the most. And one is the need, we talked about it, the need to be prepared, the, the particularly devastating quality of an earthquake. Um, and, but I think the second thing is, is the is the stuff that Lyle and others have talked about. You know, the spirit, the human spirit that you experience when you're at, I mean, you, you experience it whether you're with the Red Cross or not in some respects, but, but doing some work with the Red Cross, perhaps as a volunteer, really connects you up with the best of sort of the human spirit, people wanting to pull together and help each other out in you know, real time. Because that's what this is all reminding me of. And I agree with what everybody has said. You know, just rehashing those memories and that. I think, you know, we have tended, you know, to bury them. We say, no, I have, you know, and that whole experience because there was a lot involved you know, for me. But and taking from that and growing and, you know, learning like what I wanted to do with my life as a result. and in that and then being able to be a part of this amazing Red Cross family it's just it's brought it all home for me you know and it just feels like what happened 30 years ago you know shaped who I was going to become as an adult and that and when you're going through it you don't recognize that but then now today I have the benefit of being able to look back and seeing okay what you know changed me in that and what was my story as a result and I think for me, yeah, it was a horrific day and a horrific experience, but I'm 
in some ways happy that it happened because I was able to become somebody that um, was true to my heart in that. And so I am lucky to get to work with the people that I get to work with and surround myself with a wonderful community. And I just feel super lucky and um, appreciative of what I get to do. So. I'll say what uh, Michelle is saying. When the earthquake happened in 89, it was more of a personal thing. How do I react to this? How do I do what I can do? At this point in time, but then as I got involved with Red Cross, it became a collective thing. How do I work with this individual or that individual? How do we, as a group, work together to accomplish something? And there's one individual in this room here who really is a legend in Red Cross, and she's sitting right over there. I'm not going to name names, but <laughs> 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 it's true. We have worked with her many times at Red yeah, Cross, and she is the epitome of like what that. I like. To, I look at it as a almost like a mentor. We were in, we were called to go to Napa. This thing's out. We were called to go to Napa together to help without a shelter, and the, the local news came in. The San Francisco news came in because of Napa earthquake, and they came around. And she was totally unaware of the of the news. I mean, she is such she focuses so much on what she's doing with people that she went out with a family off front and they had a bunch of parakeets and she said they said to her, "Can we bring the parakeets inside because there are pets and kind of thing?" She said, "No, you can keep them in the car, look after them." She got to know that family so well, and as she's talking to these kids and the father and the mother, the news guy watched the go like this. <laughs> she didn't even know they were there, and they kept going like this. And it was broadcast on the news that night. That family came out, they were just a step. Did you see the news? Did you see the news? She had no clue, but that's who she is. And everywhere we go, you can be walking along with Tiki, whatever. And they don't see you, they see Tiki. Tiki! Tiki Dollar! <laughs> and she has a knack for getting to know people, getting to know where they're from. You can talk about mental health. This is this is what mental health is all about. She does it on a, on a, a basis, basis, on a yeah. normal basis. Yeah. She's yeah. not trained for it, it's just who Absolutely. she is. Yeah. This is the kind of person yeah. that I want to work with in the yeah. process. And, uh, and everybody's pretty much like that. But I, I really want to compliment Tiki on this because well, you, you are probably one of the most individual. Uh, for individuals that I ever worked with that I, I admire a great deal. Really well, do. you guys too. We, all, we work so well together that yeah. it's like we do all, you know, we go out together. And but I just want to make sure you recognize in this video because you are a legend. I'm scared. To be a legend. Like, that's all happy. It's collective effort, and I really like working with everybody that I've worked with so far with this, with this chapter and beyond. We made a good friend in, in Oklahoma. Uh, we went down to Florida for with the herb, and I got him on the phone. I said, <laughs> "He said, where are you?" He said, "Well, I'm in, in Texas right now, but we're not really busy. Well, get to your chapter and get down here because we want to work with you." He calls his chapter. We waited a day. He met us there. We went down. We worked down in Key West together as, as a group. So it's not only this chapter. We've done this throughout the, throughout the country. And he brought his grandchildren out this summer for a visit. And it was just, it was just the kind of people you meet and. Uh, I absolutely agree with that. So many times I've watched her in our meetings. She will, I don't just sit and watch her, of course. But I noticed that she's the one that will greet the new people. And she stands and focuses on them. She's only focused on them and so welcoming. So many times you walk into a group, even here, and no one acknowledges you, the new people. It's like going to church, nobody says hello to the new person. But Tiki does, and she doesn't even realize she does it. I was in Manhattan, and someone, someone says, where are you? The chapter from Santa, Santa Cruz. Do you know Tiki? That's <laughs> <laughs> true. Really? New Jersey. True. Oh, you know Tiki then? Yes. And it's, it's amazing, wherever we go, because she leaves such a lasting impression. Such a positive impression. Oh, I wouldn't be a very good criminal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, looking back uh, th over 30 years, thank you comes to mind also. Thank you for getting this group together. Yes. Because yes. it's yes. important yes. for yes. all of us to, uh, yeah. to see each other again. And though I'm out of the Red Cross, it's not out of me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I feel that uh, validated that we did a good job here uh, 30 years ago, and it's still going on. 
And, uh, and I've been to lots and lots of disasters. None's better than here. <laughs> it's always home. <laughs> but yeah, I feel thankful that we're together and that we've all learned lessons and that we, uh, uh, we will continue. Um, I find it cathartic and emotional to recount it all. Um, but I also, coming to this meeting, um, I feel like there's a legacy here that all of us kind of on this side who went through the earthquake and Tiki <laughs> and Patsy, um, the legacy is being continued and that's a wonderful feeling. When I see you, Michelle, and I hear you talk, I remember when we hired you. <laughs> It's so lovely that you're picking Aww. up and carrying on. And it's like everybody's only a volunteer for the Red Cross for a short period of time. The organization has been around for hundreds, you know, 150 years. So we all have a piece to play. And, you know, we've played our piece and now you're playing your piece. But it's wonderful that there's still a kind of cradle of caring and a, a cradle of continuity going forward. So for me, that's very satisfying. Yes. Whew. I didn't think I'd be very emotional when, when Romy was sort of thinking. <laughs> I, mean, I also thought it was compartmentalized in a nice little pocket inside my mind, but opening up and listening to the stories, uh, it touches me so much that we still are here. Some of us, <laughs> we're still working with each other and in such an amazing group to work with, and I thank you, I ditto what Carol uh, says. Both Karen and Carol were my mentors because I was like, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, blind with headlights or with deer with headlights. headlights. Yeah, I had, I had no idea what I was doing. And I just said, go for it. And Karen always said, yeah, but you're my boss. And she said, no, we're counterparts. We work equally. And I go, but yeah, but you, no. <laughs> and she would constantly do that and sort of empowered me to go ahead. And. Uh, which is normal people responding to an abnormal event, and that's sort of, we keep needing to say that, normal people responding to an abnormal event. And when I talk with people who have gone through disaster, and they think they're going crazy, or they think they're totally out of it, or whatever they think, I just say, you know what? This is an abnormal event. We're dealing with it as a normal human being having to deal and respond to this. And I'm so touched by everybody in this room. And Lee, I haven't seen for almost probably 25 years. It's just so amazing that we're all here and that we're sharing this. And I want to thank you for making it happen. I mean, we wouldn't be here if it hadn't been for you all together. I wouldn't have seen these people that I haven't seen for so long. I, I did not make the earthquake happen. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm saying is you made this wonderful event so that we could talk about it. And it's oral history is so important. I mean, we can write our story down, but telling it, every time you tell it, a little bit less tension and a little bit more emotion gets carried away to the water of the universe. And it doesn't have such a charge. So thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, well, I share all these feelings, I think. I, I, I had put it on the shelf, you know, the history, the history was on the shelf, I didn't get it out this morning, try to find it. So it was kind of in a box, you know, uh, this has brought back a lot of, a lot of things. Um, but I think um, what, what I, what, what was the, not impact, what was the... Uh, Just what, it, what it's like to reflect the 30 years later. Like, I think what, um, what I'm seeing in a, as a result of this conversation, is the hopefulness out of these situations. Uh, abnormal event, normal people, but out of it comes uh, something different, and we move on. Uh, and hopefully we move on prepared for the next one, whatever it's going to be. And it, can, it may not be a, a natural disaster, it may be a personal disaster, but I think we're all going to be stronger more as a result of these kinds of experiences. So it's a positive thing for me. I think our community is quite fortunate that um, Carol had set the foundation, uh, the strong foundation. And when I walked in, it was like organized. I remember you saying, "It's organized chaos," and and showing me around the office, and you know, here's the coffee, and here's this, and here's that, and and making feel like you're walking into a family. Um, and that's what I carry on, and, and hope that I'm conveying that as well on a daily basis. And and then um, and seeing and after Carol um, left, 
um, to take on another position with the Red Cross and having the so many interim directors um, and finally us landing with Michelle. It's having another pair of ovens again. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have any parting words before we're through? Thank you again. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for um, I really appreciate you sharing your stories with with not only the Santa Cruz Public Libraries but with the community at large, and I think it will be a a valuable thing to uh, to live on. So 